Uh, hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Good morning. Sionagada, Adrian Keen, Dawado, Chichalagi, Dalonige, De La Jutla, Jinela. Hi, everyone. I'm Adrian Keen. I am a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. And I'm originally from here in California, or the way we say it in Cherokee is yellow money from the ground, which refers to the gold brush. Um, but I would really like to acknowledge, first acknowledge and thank the Ohlone peoples whose land we're on today, and also acknowledge and thank UC Berkeley and all the folks who worked so hard at putting together um, this symposium. I'm so humbled and honored to be here and really excited to talk with you today. Um, so looking at the conference program and the power uh, and knowledge of the people in this room, I am so grateful for the opportunity to be here and again, humbled and actually a little bit freaked out because I know a lot of you actually know a lot more than me on these issues. And so many of you have influenced and supported me through my five years of blogging at Native Appropriations and I'm so appreciative of your wisdom, uh, your online and offline interactions and all of the offers to come speak at your universities. Um, Usually in my talks, I spend a long time building a case for why in why representations matter and why in 2015, we still need to be having conversations about Tonto and Hollywood Indians, mascots and red face, and how these images have weight and importance in our continued survivance as indigenous peoples. Um, but this is an audience that understands that, um, or at least I hope so. So in this talk, I'll talk about that a little bit, but instead today, I wanna talk a little bit more about the personal story behind my blog um, and give these four uh, C's that I've kind of been using as a mental framework for both my blog and also uh, the work that we're doing more broadly in indigenous new media to push back on stereotypes and misrepresentations. Um, and those four C's are critical lens, uh, contemporary issues and cultures, community and counter narratives. And then hopefully I'll be able to kind of make a case for how fighting for representations through online mediums has given rise to a new generation of young voices fighting stereotyping and cultural appropriation, and then also be able to reflect on what I've learned over these five years of blogging. So to start and kind of set the stage, I'm gonna move this up a little bit. See. Um, I wanna start with some images. So these are the images that um, I write about. These are the images that we see every day um, and I wanna set the scene a little bit. These are the things that uh, drove me to write five years ago, and these are the things that I think we need to question and continually interrogate um, as we move forward. So here we've got a, a skull with a headdress on a t-shirt on a hipster, Lego, Halloween costumes, sexy Native American Indian, Tonto and the Lone Ranger, Peter Pan, Indian mascots, this one hits close to home for me. Uh, this is a book that teaches young kids how to play Indian, um, Cherokee Red Soda, Firewater Whiskey, a teepee for your cat, baking powder, iPhone games, Eskimo Joe's Restaurant in Oklahoma, Trail of Tears, Fireworks, and then of course this image that we're constantly fighting against today as well. So these are the images that surround us, and these are what um, the most Americans think of when they think of indigenous peoples, and these are the things that I wanna question and push back against. So I have two slides that I use um, in most of my presentations just to get us all on the same page. What is cultural appropriation? What is this thing that I'm talking about constantly? And uh, the quotation I use is from uh, Lenore Keeshing Tobias, who's quoted in a Rebecca Soce article. Um, and she says, taking from a culture that is not one's own, intellectual property, cultural expressions and artifacts, history and ways of knowledge. So it's a pretty concise definition. And I also talk about the, the harms of cultural appropriation. Why is this an issue? Why is this something we need to care about? Um, and I divide it into sort of two categories. The first is the economic harms. And this is the one that people have an easier time of wrapping their heads around. They, they understand this. People understand money, they understand law. Um, so that's issues of intellectual property here. We're talking about intellectual property. Uh, there's also cases to be made for trademark and copyright infringement um, with these issues. And then there's the Indian Arts and Crafts Act of 1990, which pro pro protects Native artisans um, from misrepresentation. And then the bottom line is that the appropriating group is benefiting monetarily often from these, um, and Natives are not. And then on the flip side of thing, uh, on things is the moral and cultural arguments. And these are the ones that people have a little bit harder time wrapping their heads around. Um, because, like I said, people understand money, they understand law, but understanding the moral and cultural side is a little bit more difficult. 
Um, so also from that SOCI article, cultural appropriation interferes with a community's ability to define and establish its own identity. So if I'm standing here saying that these are the things that make me Cherokee, but Urban Outfitters comes in and says, no, actually, these are the things that make us Urban Outfitters, it interferes with our ability as Native peoples to, to draw those boundaries of who we are. And as you saw um, in the images, there are things of this that are sacred in nature, especially if we're talking about the war bonnets, about the headdresses. These are things that are used in ceremony that are reserved for uh, very specific people in our communities. And the, the power and, um, and sacred aspects of that is being taken away when you appropriate it and put it on a t-shirt. And then, of course, this contributes to stereotyping. So all of those images are the kind of one-sided Plains Indian with the feathers and the buckskin and the braids, and it collapses the diversity of our communities down into this stereotype, which, of course, is a huge problem. But the final piece is that uh, it affects our, our cultural survival and what Sosi calls our, our cultural sovereignty. So when we talk about having sovereignty in our communities and having uh, self-governance and control of our resources and our education, we also need to be able to have sovereignty over our culture and over uh, those tangible and intangible aspects of that culture. But the biggest issue is that these are issues of power that we're talking about here. This is the colonizer taking from the colonized, and so it's never going to be an equal exchange of knowledge. It's never going to be a benign sharing of cultures. This is a power imbalance that we're talking about here. So those are the, the slides that I use all the time to just try and get us on the same page. But now I wanted to give the creation story of Native appropriations, um, where the blog came from. And I am using creation story specifically because I want to talk about creation in sort of an indigenous sense. Um, in our stories, they um, most often start with something. It's never that there was nothing and all of a sudden there was something. That's kind of a more Western way of thinking of creation as this like finite and moment of, um, of creation, but in indigenous ways, it's more about transformation and about adaptation and about movement. And so this blog was building, up, excuse me, was building upon what was already there. On the decades of representations work, of activism, of community organizing, I just happened to be able to move it into this new area and start to um, adapt and transform the, the conversation a little bit. So um, I wanted to use creation in that sense to talk about building upon what was there before. Um, so back in 2009, I was a first year doctoral student at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I was 23. I was the youngest in my program by about five years. I was the only one who hadn't been in graduate school before. Um, and I had just come from Stanford, where I was an undergraduate and then worked in undergraduate admissions for two years. So at Stanford, we had a really um, strong Native community. There were a lot of other Native students. The faculty and staff were supportive of the Native students on campus. And I never had to feel like I was the lone representative for all of Indian country. I hardly ever took another class where there wasn't another Native student. And I somehow managed to take an entire major's worth of Native um, studies courses from only Native faculty. So I was hella spoiled, is the bottom line. And then I moved out to the East Coast, and all of a sudden, I was the only one. Um, and I was not only far away from my, my family and my community in California, um, there was this like weird, cold whiteness everywhere. I was, like, <laughs> I was actually thinking about snow when I said that, but I think, um, I guess that goes for the people as well. Um, uh, yeah, right now it's like below freezing back in Rhode Island where I live. Um, but I also was faced with an entire schedule of classes that not only had no Native faculty, but we had no readings about Native peoples, no Native scholars on any of my syllabi. And then on top of it, um, there was this overwhelming ignorance from my classmates that I'd never experienced before. So my classmates at Harvard were telling me to my face that they thought all Indians were extinct or that they'd never met a Native person. And they had no interest in uh, the issues or communities I cared about. And they didn't really care to learn. It was just completely off of their, their radar. Um, right in Harvard Square, there's an Urban Outfitters. There's a big Urban Outfitters. And if you're super lazy like me, you can cut through Urban Outfitters to cut about a block and a half off of your little commute. And I used to do that all the time. Um, and one day, back in 2009, 2010, it was the very start of all these tribal trends that we see now. Um, and I was walking through Urban Outfitters and was disgusted by what I saw. There were totem pole uh, jewelry stands and neon dream catchers made by the other kind of Indian. Um, and fake moccasins and headdress t-shirts and feather earrings and just was overwhelmed by the um, amount of cultural appropriation that I was seeing. 
And uh, that day in the store, something sort of clicked. And I realized that the reason that my classmates didn't know that contemporary Native peoples existed or care about our modern struggles and triumphs was because the only images they ever saw were these things like the crud in the urban outfitters or the images I showed at the beginning of this. So to them, Native peoples were these decontextual stereotypes without any relation to the reality of Indian country. And I decided that that was a problem. So in undergrad, I was, I was engaged in issues of representation, mostly in museum contexts. And I interned at NMAI and was interested in contemporary uh, Native art. And of course, at Stanford, we also dealt with um, the, the mascot issue popping up over and over again. So I had some experience. Um, but I put up a Facebook note back when people did that. Um, and I asked my friends to start sending me things for a project. Um, I didn't know what it was going to be. I just had a project in mind. Um, and I was actually kind of excited to see that this was still on Facebook, a uh, little artifact there. So I got back to my computer. Uh, well, first I went back to Urban Outfitters armed with like an actual digital camera, because at the time I had a Razor flip phone, so that didn't, uh, didn't help me in that sense. Um, and took pictures covertly of all the stuff I had seen. And then back on my computer, I fired up Blogger and decided to start a blog called Native Appropriations. And why Native Appropriations? Because I wanted to talk about cultural appropriation and I wanted to talk about Natives, so I decided to smush it together. Um, and I've only run into issues with that a couple of times, um, mostly with interacting with government types who ask me if my blog is about the allocation of money in Indian country, but maybe someday. Um, so anyway, on January 13th, um, 2010, or January 15th, the blog was born, and it started with a trip to Urban Outfitters. And this is what the blog used to look like in 2010, all like dark and emo. Um, <laughs> And I used my three-hour weekly pro seminar that I had to take as my, um, as my time to madly write in the back of the classroom. So during that first year, I was pretty prolific, and don't tell my faculty. Um, but I honestly never thought anyone was going to read it, uh, maybe my mom, maybe my sister. Um, I thought it would be a place for me to sort of catalog these things that I was seeing, a repository of images, a place for me to start to find the words to talk about why these were hurtful. Um, because at the time, I didn't really know why. Um, but somehow it grew, and it grew even more than I ever possibly could have imagined. Um, and I started getting comments from people I didn't know, which was excited and exciting and terrifying. Um, and the blog book has changed a lot through the years. Um, this is what it looks like now, um, after the, the fifth anniversary, which was a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I also launched a new tagline for the blog, Representations Matter. Uh, before it was examining representations of indigenous peoples, which is a huge mouthful and a little bit too literal. So um, representations matter, I think, represents more what I hope to um, accomplish with the blog and uh, what I hope to move forward with. In addition to the blog, I have this Facebook page and uh, also a Twitter account, both of which have grown to a ridiculous number of followers. Um, it's a little bit overwhelming. As of today, I actually have 103,000 likes on Facebook, which completely boggles my mind. Who are these people? I have no idea. Uh, I could have 99,000 spam bots. I really don't know. Um, but that's kind of where we are today with the blog. Um, I recently just wrote my 300th post, um, which in the five year anniversary was a little bit ago. So I hope that there are still many more years and many more posts within me. So these four C's, um, I wanted to bring it to them. Um, and I feel like they kind of represent uh, what I do with the blog and also what we've been doing in a broader movement around these issues of representation. Um, and why C's? I have no idea. They all just started with C. Um, why four? Also have no idea. It's not anything like sacred directions or anything. I, I just, <laughs> I don't know. I probably could have done like 10, but we're going to stay with four. So the first one is critical lens. Um, and this is the heart of what I do with the blog um, and what I try to cultivate um, in others that I interact with, both online and offline. Um, I'm in a room of contemporaries in this, so I don't think I have to justify myself too much. I'm sure many of you hear from others that it's just a TV show or it's just a t-shirt and you should get over it, um, but we know better. Uh, I personally find a lot of joy in critiquing um, and reclaiming power through that critique. Um, I love this quote from James Baldwin. If I love you, I have to make you conscious of the things that you do not see. And that's really what this work is for me. Um, it's sometimes it's mean and I'm a little bit snarky and I use all caps, but uh, it's really out of love. Um, I swear. <laughs> uh, and so how does this play out? I want to give a quick rundown of some of the, the 
the greatest hits in the last few years of the blog and the ways that um, these issues have spread um, throughout social media and new media as well, and some of the wins that we've had as a community. So I apply this critical lens in a lot of different areas. Um, primarily, I recently have been talking a lot about fashion, and so I have some images just to show you. I'll click through really quickly just to show when you narrow the lens in on one particular realm, what are we talking about? Um, so this is from ASOS, Go Native with Aztec and Navajo prints, because, you know, Aztec and Navajo are exactly the same. Uh, Hello Kitty with a headdress. This is Carly Kloss in the um, Victoria's Secret runway show. I'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, but I like the combination of the, like, Navajo squash blossom jewelry with the Plains headdress and the, like, super traditional Jaguar bikini. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is J. Crew with the TP. This House of Harlow is Nicole Ritchie's line. These are uh, moccasins for kids that run like 300 bucks, which you could buy real ones for that. Um, Tommy Hilfiger, this is Echo. Adidas, Jeremy Scott took um, images directly from First Nations totem poles. Um, this was last year at Fashion Week. Nicholas K., the inspiration for their line was an Apache shamanistic journey, um, which was ridiculous. And then recently, we dealt with Ralph Lauren, had this winter catalog of cultural appropriation where they used images of Native peoples um, from the assimilation era to sell products. So there's plenty to critique in these worlds of fashion specifically. I talk about the story of Paul Frank a lot. So I'm going to give you the three slide version. I have like a 20 slide version. But basically, the moral of the story is that in 2012, Paul Frank had a party called Dream Catch In with Paul Frank. They used the image of the mascot of the company, which is a monkey in a headdress um, on a dream catcher. Uh, the party, um, Jessica Metcalf, who, works, uh, who writes at Beyond Buckskin, was the one who discovered this and um, discovered that over a thousand images online from the party. People playing Indian, um, uh, doing mock scalpings and mock beheadings on this runway. It was just a total, total mess. And so I wrote a blog post about it. Uh, Jessica wrote a blog post about it. It got picked up by Indian Country Today, Jezebel, Huffington Post, um, and a bunch of other sites. And then there were thousands of Facebook comments from people who were really upset and really in outraged by this. And so, uh, lo and behold, I got an email from the president of Paul Frank. Um, and he reached out to me and Jessica um, and said, hey, we messed up big time and we want to fix this. And so I want to have a conversation with you and let's see how we can fix this. So by the end of the conversation, um, we had developed this pathway for a collaboration with um, Native designers and Paul Frank to showcase real Native fashion, um, to showcase what can happen when Native peoples are allowed to represent themselves. So it was a 10 month long process. It was long, I didn't get paid, it was hard. But at the end of it, we had this incredible collaboration with Louis Vong, Autumn Don Gomez, Candace Halcrow, and Dustin Martin, and Paul Frank. And these designers come from different regions, they come from different tribes, they offer different perspectives on design. And so um, it had a really diverse and interesting perspective on the Paul Frank brand. So here were some of the products. The ones in the back are from Louis Gong, who is Nooksack from Northwest Coast. So you can see the form line with the animals and um, Julius the monkey pe peeking out there. Autumn Don Gomez is um, Comanche, and her stuff is in the middle. Uh, and she uses those really cool fuse beads that you played with when you were little, but creates these incredible art pieces of jewelry from it. Candace Halcrow beads on, um, she's Plains Korean uh, Métis from Canada, and she beads on sunglasses. So she um, did a Paul Frank line of beaded sunglasses. And then Dustin Martin is Navajo, so the images in the front are from his line where he was able to incorporate um, Navajo aesthetics with the Paul Frank line. Uh, he also had a great shirt that was called Point Lips, Not Fingers, which I thought was cute. Um, so this was, I love the story of Paul, the, this Paul Frank collaboration because it's complete. It has a beginning of this offensive party, and it shows what companies can do if they actually put their mind to it. And at the end of it, the company, I mean, we did a lot of the groundwork for them, but they said, you know, this really isn't that hard for us. Collaborations are things we do all the time. We just never thought of um, this being something we needed to do. So that is the, the one example I wanted to give of the, the full complete thing. But We've also uh, talked about Urban Outfitters. In um, 2011, they had over 24 products named Navajo on their site. Um, and Navajo Nation went ahead and sent a cease and desist letter to the company um, and said, we actually hold the trademark for uh, the name Navajo in conjunction with 
uh, textiles and with products um, of that nature. So you need to stop using it. And Urban Outfitters was kind of like, mm, no, we're not going to. And so now the nation went ahead and sued Urban Outfitters and that um, lawsuit is still in process. And it has huge implications for this work and um, what we do in being able to protect our names, our tribal names through um, the system already set up of trademark and, and copyright. Then there was this shirt, Manifest Destiny, that was at Gap. Um, Mark McNary, the designer of the shirt, tweeted out, Manifest Destiny, survival of the fittest. Um, everyone, of course, was outraged, and Gap ended up pulling the t-shirt. So the next examples are ways that we have, um, as a community, really made, um, made change and push back against these. So Gap pulled the shirt um, after outrage Twitter response. No Doubt had a really offensive music video for Looking Hot, ended up pulling it um, after complaints from uh, the community online. Carly Klaus, who we talked about earlier, um, we all got really upset about it, and um, Victoria's Secret apologized and actually pulled the, um, the look from the, the televised um, broadcast. And then Carly Klaus even apologized when it totally wasn't her fault. She didn't have really control over what she was put in, but um, that was definitely a big win. Then there's quicker things, like Sonic had this super racist sign and it um, got pulled super quickly and there was an apology. A tribe called Red, DJ Indian, or Ian Camper has been, um, had a long campaign against a team called the R Words in his hometown and they eventually changed their name. Then the Canadian iTunes store started censoring the R Word. Uh, and then not your mascot is a hashtag has been a huge thing that's been trending over the last few years. And even during the, the Super Bowl last year, it was trending nationwide. So these are examples of how having a critical lens on things that um, normally might be normalized and not um, questioned can really start to get the ball rolling and make changes in these areas. So the idea of creating a critical lens is that folks will never be able to see things the same way again. Um, by giving people the tools to interpret and understand on their own and you take away their ignorance defense. Uh, they can no longer say, I had no idea that that was offensive. Um, and then I also want to share this power that I feel of being able to critique the images and reclaim the, the power over them with other marginalized people and say, you don't have to take this um, for what it is. You can start to pull away the mask of, um, of why this is so normalized. So contemporary issues. So the critical lens stuff is really my everyday sort of bread and butter. This is what we work with online a lot is the response to things that come out. It's a very sort of reactive um, place that we're in. And I, I think it works and I think it's good. But I also draw in on the blog, um, I talk about a lot of the contemporary issues in our communities and things that we might not necessarily um, talk about a lot because um, things like dating are, are things that um, really affect us as Native people. So I have a couple of, of posts about love in the time of blood quantum and what it means to be a Native person and trying to navigate dating and courtship and love and babies and all this stuff. Um, and then I also get to bring in my, my academic research and my um, education research because I should probably mention that this is a hobby. <laughs> this isn't my PhD. This isn't the, the work that I do. My, my academic research is on Native students applying to college, navigating the college process. So I get to speak to them as well. So I've written a couple of open letters um, to Native students to just talk about um, some of the issues that they're facing, whether it's with dealing with the complaints about against affirmative action, um, or this letter was recently in response to the death of a student um, at Stanford um, due to suicide. So. Being able to have this space where I can bring Native peoples back into the blog as well um, and make the audience for us as well as for um, people outside of it is really important to me. Um, and it also pushes back on all those stereotypes of Native peoples as set in the historic past um, and is not being contemporary modern people. So uh, that's something that's really important to me as well is to situate us in the modern day and really highlight the, the things that are going on. Um, and the responses to these pieces in particular has been really, really amazing. Um, and I think has started a lot of conversations um, and been able to, to move conversations forward that we haven't really been able to in a lot of, um, in a lot of spaces. So it's been fun for me, uh, though also makes me feel really vulnerable at times. <laughs> um, so the next one is uh, community. And the community aspect of this blog is something, and this work generally, is something that I never could have imagined or anticipated, but it's been by far the most incredible part of this. Um, I'm going to use this image to talk about it. So I started the blog because I felt alone and I felt 
oh, okay. Um, and I felt isolated, but I created this, I was able to create this community of like-minded activists and scholars and people all over the world, um, indigenous folks from Canada and New Zealand and all over the place. So um, relationships to me are so important. And through the blog, I've been able to meet and connect with people that are some of the most important folks in my life. And this image is from Santa Fe Indian Market last year, and I just love it because it's like these fierce indigenous women, and in it we have a couple of PhDs, we have masters in engineering, we have artists, we have activists, we have museum professionals, we have higher ed professionals, um, it's just we have medical students, and these are all people that I've met through this community of um, activism around representations. And then I also have this scholarly community that I never anticipated. Um, being the lone native scholar at Harvard, I didn't have anyone to talk to about my theory questions or things like that. So I would crowdsource them on Twitter. Um, and those connections with fellow indigenous scholars, many of you who are in the room, um, has been what has made my um, experience as a, a native doctoral student incredible. The last is counter narratives. Um, and this to me, uh, I use counter narratives from critical race theory to thinking about speaking back to the dominant discourse to creating an alternative narrative to what everyone um, is the, the mainstream kind of way of thinking. And through this, um, I talk about positive representations. And this is something that I'm still working on and moving towards. And I think um, as a community, we are as well. For five years, all I've been doing is, is tearing apart misrepresentations. I've been saying, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, but I haven't really been giving people something to replace it with. So people know what we're not, but they don't really know what we are. And so through um, highlighting some more positive representations, I am hoping to, um, to change that. And this is a slide that I've used before, and I think it's hilarious because the two examples I use are sitting right there. So I often talk about the 1491s and how um, we're able to push back through humor and reshape it. And then um, also Matika's project and how she's changed in the way we see Native America. Um, and then Beyond Buckskin, which uh, gives access to buying Native and supporting Native designers. Um, and instead of buying at Urban Outfitters, you can buy from um, Native artisans who are doing this for their work. And then I also just like to talk about my friends and the cool things that we're doing. Also another picture from Indian Market, but just in this picture alone, um, we have Stanford alums um, and we have uh, Silversmiths and a NASA scientists and a lawyer. So um, in the people that I know and in the people I interact with are these, um, these counter stories, these counter representations. And then the hashtag positive representations is something that I'm trying to promote as well to get people to talk about the good things in Indian country. So quickly, um, I just want to talk about what two things, well, one thing that I've learned in the last five years. The, the biggest thing is that one time a friend called my blog consenting to learn in public. And that's been the biggest thing that I've learned is that when I'm open and I'm vulnerable and I say, you know, I have more questions than answers on this. I don't have all the language. Um, I'm a native person who's still figuring a lot of things out. Being able to be open about that is what has um, enabled the blog to move things forward in a lot of ways, I feel like. So it's scary to admit that you're wrong. It's scary to say, you know what, I totally have changed my thinking on what I said a few years ago. But this process of consenting to learn in public, um, I think is really powerful um, and is something that uh, a lot of our arenas, especially online, could uh, learn from a little bit as well. So the phrase has really stuck with me and I think it really fits what I'm trying to do um, with the blog. So these things don't end. These things are continual. Um, and in five years, I also learned that I'm getting tired. Um, and last month, we dealt with Ralph Lauren um, and the Winter Catalog of Cultural Appropriation. And right now, just this week, my friend Bethany Yellowtail found out that a designer directly ripped off her crow pop design at New York Fashion Week. Um, and the whole line was a cultural appropriation hot mess. And it often feels like it never stops. Um, and I honestly sometimes um, find it hard to find the counterpoints and how to reframe the same argument that I've been making for five years. But there are really bright spots and I now don't have to be the only one on uh, leading this conversation. And there's uh, new outlets like Natives in America, which highlights young Native voices to talk about issues in their communities, which is really heartening to me. There's other people in this room who are blogging and talking about these issues. Before I used to feel like a, a lone read out there, but now there's a lot of support. And we can also quantify that and we can see how the conversation has grown. Um, this is Google Trends. Um, and you can see for the term cultural appropriation, we went from 
basically nothing in 2009-ish to now the conversation is, is really growing and continues. Um, so that to me is amazing. So um, a long time ago, I outsourced uh, or I crowdsourced what people were thinking about this work in new media and representations and what they thought the effects of this work was. So I, being the researcher I am, I collected the responses, I coded across them, and I found these kind of themes. And I'll leave the quotes up there for you to read since I'm short on time. But the three themes that came out from these responses from readers and from po folks in the community were creating a global community of indigenous activists and allies, creating vocabulary, resources, and support to speak out on these issues, and creating challenges to deeper issues of white privilege, colonialism, and power. And um, I think the quotes kind of show the ways that that has happened for folks. So I want to end with this slide. These are my baby cousins. Um, they live in LA. And I love this image because um, it shows how connected the next generation already is. Um, they are wired. They're ready to consume this media. Um, and while their adorable laptop, laptops might just be toys right now, um, soon enough they're going to be on Facebook, they're going to be on Instagram, they're going to be trolling through the internet. And I want to make the world better for them. I want to uh, make the world better for them in a lot of ways, but I also want them to grow up knowing that their culture has deep roots and has real and vibrant, and is also real and vibrant and modern. I want them to see themselves reflected in uh, representations of Native peoples. I don't want to see them uh, have to deal with models disrespecting headdresses or a production of Peter Pan in 2014 that still uses Uggerwug and wild Indians. I don't want them to see their people being used as a mascot. So I'll keep fighting, and we'll all keep fighting. Uh, the change has been incremental over all these years, but the conversation has been created. Um, it's been created in this indigenous sense. It's been transformed, developed, moved, and adapted, and it will be continually created into the future. So through this critical lens, this focus on contemporary issues, community and counter narratives, we can hope that each day, each tweet, each blog and Facebook post makes it better for my little cousins, for all the little cousins, for all the little brothers and sisters. And so one day they will be truly seen um, and not seen as stereotypes or relics of the past, but as the amazing, brilliant, indigenous people that they are. And so this, to me, is why representations matter. So, Widow, thank you.